Welcome everybody to this project briefing on the OA switchboard. From toll roads to highways, how the OA switchboard is building the infrastructure for an OA-driven scholarly communications landscape. The OA switchboard is a neutral information exchange hub streamlining the communication between funders, institutions and publishers regarding OA publications. It's a tool, it's a simple tool as I will show you in this project briefing, but we believe it can enable a breakthrough in the transformation of the markets such that open access is supported as the predominant model of publication. My name is Yvonne Kempfens. I'm the executive director of the newly founded foundation that will run the OA switchboard moving forward as of January. And in 2020, I was the project manager when the OA switchboard was still a project overseen by OSPA, the Association of Open Access Publishers. And I will be presenting today together with Liz Ball from JISC, Sarah Rui from PLOS and Maurice York from the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Where are we with enabling open access? Well, obviously open access output is growing year on year and you can view statistics on the OSPA website. OSPA does a survey every year and it clearly shows the uh, growing trend in uh, OA output. And increasingly funders and institutions are paying for OA centrally. Business models are becoming more complex, diverse, some with or without individual publication fees, some through agreements with publishers and some through sponsorship models like Diamond. Uh, funders and institutions are also expanding their requirements about how various research outputs should be published and the result is a situation if we talk about journals where there may be multiple authors involved in a specific publication each with multiple institutional affiliations and funder arrangements and we call that multilateral publication level arrangements now what is the challenge around these multi-level multilateral open access publication level arrangements for all three stakeholders, funders, institutions and publishers alike. It's very complex. It's administrative heavy, but it's simply complex to implement these agreements. I already mentioned multiple authors, institutional affiliations, funder arrangements, but don't underestimate also the myriad of systems and, and processes with all these players and stakeholders involved it gets very complicated and messy everybody has their own way of working and, and think about all the operational relationships and the communication going on it's a challenge and in preparing for this talk i had a chat with Liz Ball, Sarah Rui, and Maurice York about what problems they see that need to be resolved in the transition to open access and we're going to listen to a, a recording of that so as we uh seek to progress with the transition to open access across the, the whole publishing landscape, what we are faced with is um, a significant challenge around transparency. So um, really there's a lack of transparency around the types of data collected and stored around publications. Um, and as we really look to um, for a cost effective and sustainable solution, um, sus oh, sorry, sustainable transition to open access, it's critical that we have the data we need to be able to assess that um, and um, ensure that agreements are in place uh, to support that sustainability. And um, in line with that as well, I, the costs of OA uh, can be prohibitive. So really more transparency around costs, and that's not just article processing charges, but also the total cost of ownership with regards to open access. Um, and in general, there's a need for a neutral partner um, to address this problem uh, that doesn't represent um, you know, any of the interests of the particular stakeholders and range of stakeholders involved. Absolutely. So one of the key challenges um, that we're uh, looking at is essentially how to move from uh, 15 uh, separate institutions that collaborate towards working together um, as a collective alliance uh, towards particularly solving the public uh, challenges um, with uh, publishing, with open access, um, picking up this gesture of how do we create intentional strategies uh, to um, enable the move towards open access broadly across all of our institutions for all of our faculty authors, um, and to really change the equation for how funding flows. Um, one of those big ones is understanding, first of all, how funding flows and what money goes where, um, and also how we can start to shift that um, balance. 
um, looking at the amount of money that's in the system, who pays, how that pay flows, um, and then put in place, once we understand that, strategies for actually shifting that intentionally towards what we'd like to see. Um, so we have those two problems. One is understanding the broad landscape and what it is that they're, we're doing, what it is individually. All the institutions have very intentional strategies and have been moving those. So it's a question of how do we look across and look at our collective strategies and bring intention into that and how we, how we can start to construct the workflows and, and the functional methods of collaboration that help enable those. Um, um, at PLOS, we have a number of, of challenges we're trying to solve for here with, res with respect to um, infrastructure, particularly because we have not historically engaged with libraries and therefore don't have um, what seems like the very obvious infrastructure to support um, that kind of partner. Um, one is simply reporting. Um, uh, JISC, for example, has a very uh, robust set of requirements to partner with them in terms of article metadata for um, every publication that they're, they're funding. Um, many uh, institutions, whether they're JISC in the US or elsewhere around the world, um, have, have very basic requirements, like do you have counter data, whether or not that's particularly relevant, you know, do you have it? Um, so PLOS really needs a mechanism to deploy uh, this kind, these kinds of reports that doesn't require us to build an entire infrastructure or portal uh, the way many of our other larger competitors have um, so that libraries don't have to go to many different spaces to get the same piece of information. Ideally, there's kind of a one-stop um, uh, place for them to do that. Additionally, um, the sort of management of fees and infrastructure around um, tracking fees, approving fees, determining this institution is part of a deal with no fees, but it only covers five journals. And what about the other two? The kind of nuance there that can really cripple um, an accounting system. Uh, the, the, fa the idea that a shared resource could support that is, is very appealing. Well, thanks, Liz, Sarah, and Morris. Uh, that gives a great overview of the challenges at stake here from different stakeholder groups. So now, how is the OA switchboard helping with practical solution, with a working solution, and um, in, in various areas? So this lack of transparency absolutely came up, and data can help to improve transparency. But there's also a challenge because it, it's very often a sensitive topic. So we need to collaborate to define who can see what and who can have access to what. But there's no doubt to achieve a transition to OA, we need better and more and, and clearer data, um, both publication and financial information. And that will come from multiple systems. And um, so in order to respect privacy and security there, we have to do something. And, and we are addressing that in the switchboard through contracts and technical solutions. Bringing down costs, it's possible. Efficiency and cost effectiveness are definitely possible. First of all, if we collaborate to agree standards, that will bring down transaction cost. If we collaborate, secondly, to achieve streamlined communication, that will bring down cost. And last but not least, if we work together and use state-of-the-art technology to develop a collaborative shared infrastructure, like other industries, banking, airlines, telecom have done for decades. Um, but these are, some of these are heated topics and it was already mentioned, then it would help to have a neutral intermediary that everybody trusts to deal with these topics. Now, what solution was developed already way before the project in 2020 started? Um, uh, this topic was being discussed by various stakeholders and quite early on they thought an independent, neutral intermediary who only deals with the exchange of information, streamlines the communication, is contributing to the solution. So bringing standards, agreeing the standards, having a shared infrastructure and providing back office services to communicate and exchange things between the three stakeholder groups is the solution. And that is what the OA switchboard does. As I mentioned, 2020 was a project and we always had the ambition that everything worked out with an MVP and proving the concept can work technically. We want to move and we have to move to a structural setup. Uh, it cannot continue as a project under OSPA. So this year we spent also quite a bit of time discussing with the different stakeholders, what are our principles moving forward if we're designing that structure, what should be covered? First of all, neutrality and independence are preserved. 
through the structure and the governance and the funding model that we choose. Also, very important, all three stakeholder groups should be around the table. The funders, the publishers, the institution should have equal say in what's happening with the OA switchboard. We should be able to fund ourselves through a self-sustaining, not-for-profit, obviously, business model but we obviously need some money to run the operation and keep on developing. Uh, our promise, our ambition is to support all OA business models, policies and types of scholarly output. So whether it's diamond, whether it's APC based, whether it's a book, whether it's a proceedings paper or journal, um, our ambition and promise is to support all. Also in terms of developing the services and doing that uh, through an open source uh, solution, we work with all stakeholders to determine the functionality, to agree the standards and, and so on. And sixth is that we serve three masters. We should never forget that. So we, we will provide value and our ambition is to also do that equally, provide value to institutions, funders and uh, publishers alike even though the way in which the value is delivered is maybe not the same, but there should be an equal balance in, in what we do for the three stakeholder groups. So sustainability is now ensured moving forward through a new not-for-profit foundation without shareholders. And um, it is a this neutral intermediary that meets all the six requirements that or the principles that I was talking through, um, enabling shared infrastructure, bringing transparency and efficiency and cost effectiveness to the open access ecosystem. But what is it? What is the hub? What is the tool that I was talking about? The OA switchboard is a central information exchange hub connecting parties and systems and streamlining and standardizing the communication and neutral exchange of OA related publication level information. That's important. It's always situational and it's always interaction at a point in time. So there is no database, there's no uh, big database of policies or contracts or what have you. There is a situation at hand uh, about which uh, a funder and, an, and a publisher uh, want to communicate and the switchboard enables them to do that. We enable a financial settlement to be done, but I can't stress enough the OA switchboard does not get involved in invoicing or collecting money. It's only information about the settlement. So whether that's an APC or an arrangement under a read and publish deal or a diamond model, uh, it's the information about the financial settlement and not the settlement itself. Now, in essence, even one level deeper, very, very practically, this is it. The OA switchboard is a hub. It's, that's the technology in the middle and the messages are predefined. Uh, we spent most of our time talking about the standards and the schemas and what goes in the messages. And basically the OA switchboard enables stakeholder one to send a message or ask a question um, uh, to stakeholder two and enable stakeholder two to respond through the switchboard. The technology validates the message, the, if the message is complete, if it meets the schema and the, and the standards, and it will route the message from stakeholder one to stakeholder two and we're using the ROAR identifier to do so. Um, stakeholder one, in, in theory, in, in essence, can be a funder, a publisher, or an institution, and stakeholder two as well. However, for the MVP, the minimum viable product, uh, and we had limited time and limited money in 2020, so we had to define what is the minimum we want to do to prove the concept. And um, that is why we have in the MVP defined two messages and both of them initiate from the publisher. Uh, but you can imagine now that the infrastructure is in place, it's a, a much smaller task to define additional messages. Uh, the work will go into defining the standards and agreeing with the stakeholders what the exact question is and what the message uh, should be. A little bit of detail now to show you what it really is. The two questions are an eligibility inquiry, and this one usually goes out before publication of an article. By the way, the MVP is also journals only. And the second type of message is a publication or payment settlement notification message, and more about that in next slides. And then there's various scenarios between a publisher and an institution or funder. There is nothing like an agreement in place, nothing. So it's just a standalone article. And then the question will simply be, will you, institution funder, cover the article level publication charges for this intended publication with all these authors, affiliations, fund refs, grant refs, all the information we have, will you cover it? 
And in that message is information like the license type, the APC charge, maybe additional charges and, and what have you. Then the second scenario is a prior agreement and that is split in two. Some prior agreements require article level information, others don't. And if they don't, the question is pretty simple. It's do you agree this publication can be charged against our existing deal? And the answer is equally simple. The question, will you pick up the charges, is simply yes, no, or partial. The funder or the institution can respond through the standardized message that they will pick up the full APC, but not the full color charges, and so on. And quite a nice feature, which is being tested by, by our pilot users and, and also our launching customers, is to then at this point already inform the publisher about your invoicing conditions and that can be as simple as a purchase order number but quite crucial for an efficient uh, handling of the invoice later on. Same kind of type of answers, yes, no, if there's financial information also whether it's uh, the fee is acceptable and the same thing adding conditions or, or remarks. So this all happens before publication and then once the article is published gone through peer review and it's really being published the publication notification the p1 message is to confirm that the article is now really published with all definitive information the authors in the right order all version of record information including a doi and also information about how the settlement of the finances is. So for instance, some publishers are planning to include a URL link to their invoicing system, where in that P1 message, there's simply a, a link where the recipient can go to pay for the publication charges. Again, if there's a prior agreement, that's not always necessary and the message can simply be, this is the publication with all the relevant details and um, uh, we will according to whatever we agreed in our contract, charge it against our deal. And again, we don't need to know in the switchboard, we don't keep any information about what that type or financial arrangement or payment uh, arrangement is uh, between the publisher and the institution. There is no response necessary, it's optional because this is a notification, if all is well. Institution funder uh, and the publisher have already talked about this uh, publication, have already given the green light that they're picking up the charges. So this is just a notification that could be uh, sufficient, but optionally there can be an answer. Now, what is the value that the OA switchboard will bring? And uh, I have many more slides about that. I won't talk about it today, but you can imagine specifically for funders or for institutions or publishers, there's a whole set of underlying benefits and, and value to these generic statements. But in general, the transparency, the clearer data is what this is all about. And saving efficiency, time and manual work, but also cost effectiveness and an opportunity for better service to, to the researcher, but also potentially for a publisher to the institutions and the funders. And what we've learned in, in talking to so many people this year is that there are direct benefits, especially for those who are directly involved in settling financials and maybe um, uh, APCs, but there's also indirect benefits for people who may be doing things on your behalf, like institutions managing block grants on behalf of funders. And there's also the community benefits. I mean, the whole system to be able to learn, adjust and progress as, as Liz and Sarah and um, Morris already alluded to, if you have data, if you have information, you can progress and you can define uh, uh, policies and, and uh, approaches and strategies for the future. And then I, I don't want to forget, I want to stress, even though the OA switchboard does not have an interface for the author researcher, remember we are behind the scenes, this is back office, there is a value that all three stakeholders will embrace and it is try to get the author researcher out of the equation when it comes to financial administrational settlements. I've heard many stories about authors having to get involved in exchanging information between their institution and the publisher about, again, a purchase order number and I don't think anybody wants that. We'd rather automate that and allow the researchers to focus on research. Now, the OA switchboard is a simple solution, uh, but what makes it sometimes complex in, in, in talks like this is that it has so much um, potential and it can support multiple use cases. So what I want to illustrate here, and this is just the publication uh, uh, workflow obviously from, uh, from grant through publication, the OA switchboard can be called upon or it can be integrated at various points in time in the workflow and in the, in the systems. Um, and this is super flexible. Uh, again, it's a simple tool 
that can be integrated ideally uh, automated uh, and, and not manual there there is a user interface for funders institutions and publishers so for the occasional situation or if the volume is low it can be done but ideally this is integrated and it can be done at any point in time it's all api based i forgot to mention that um, now partnering with the oa switchboard has the potential to solve our challenges and again i talked with sarah liz and morris about that and let's see what they have to say about that how the oa switchboard can help them uh, solve their challenges uh, so in addition to increasing transparency and um, reducing barrier to entry for pure array and smaller publishers um, i really see huge promise uh, from the OA switchboard and in enabling institutions to manage and report on their publications and costs more effectively. So, um, you know, potential use cases could be uh, the automatic feed of essential data around publications directly onto their local systems, linking invoices to publication data, you know, reducing that burden, um, really <laughs> enabling them to monitor funds more effectively, anticipate um, where funds need to be allocated to publications, at key points in that publication life cycle um, and you know even assess if a, a particular OA publication meets uh, funder requirements. So I think the, the potential use cases um, are vast and really it offers a very simple solution for us to build upon in the whole open research ecosystem. Um, so I think what has uh, becomes one of our central problems that we need to look at and really bring intention and action to is this relationship between open content and open infrastructure. Um, the move towards open knowledge, towards expanding open content and open scholarship is incredibly important in so many strategic ways for our institutions. Um, and we need to uh, bring alongside this question of the open infrastructure. So if we succeeded in opening up knowledge and content, for example, but we haven't opened the infrastructure, have we really moved the needle on OA and what we want to see? If we've only opened up infrastructure, but we haven't had a corresponding movement in the, in the, in the content itself, have we moved the needle? So what the problem we're uh, examining closely is how do we move both of those alongside of each other? Um, so that there's community uh, ownership and investment in the infrastructure itself, as well as in the authorship and creation of the content. Um, and OA Switchboard is really one of those uh, emerging and incredibly important pieces of uh, open infrastructure and, and how we build that out. And for the Big Ten Academic Alliance, um, we're looking at that landscape and where can we make the investments? How can we bring uh, the proper balance between both of these so that we can provide a real benefit um, to, uh, to researchers, to authors who are creating the content, an incredibly important part of our output. Research, uh, we are research institutions, we are published institutions. And on the other hand, uh, libraries, uh, as libraries, we're also purchasing that content and subscribing to it. So how can we find the infrastructure that marries those together? So a specific use case, uh, for example, um, would be that the flow of money um, for subscriptions and access to content is different from what authors use in order to publish and to pay uh, ABCs, for example, and charges for publishing. And those two aren't necessarily aware of each other, but how we can start to connect them and build an awareness of how much is in each place, how we have access to them, how we have um, uh, funders and, uh, and conversation between authors as well as institutions and start to gain some knowledge of how these work together and build some real pathways for communication between those. Um, and that's a use case that uh, the OA switchboard steps uh, squarely into and provides some promise for. Here's some pathways that could provide um, real solutions for how to open up that dynamic and, and, and building on this idea of transparency, uh, provide transparency and, and visibility into how that flow works and then um, as well as uh, access and intention with how we can shape those and design them in a way that works best, uh, not only works best for us and um, authors and researchers, but also real enables uh, an intentional transformation of the open knowledge and, and scholarly commu communications ecosystem that we would like to see. I think OA infrastructure, uh, Liz and, and, and Morris have really outlined uh, the essential components that it brings to making this transition to OA, whatever that means, um, possible. Uh, something that Morris touched on that I want to underscore is the the importance of the equity uh, that it brings to the um, to the system. 
um, many of the challenges I think we're seeing around this very aggressive push to OA, particularly with respect to mandates like Plan S, is there are um, certain organizations, uh, either because of their size, their mission, their location, uh, are really gonna struggle to make that transition uh, in a way that's um, sustainable. And OA infrastructure, like OA Switchboard, is going to be a really important component to allowing those players to make this transition in a way that uh, is not crippling in terms of the infrastructure required to do it. So that's one reason I'm really excited uh, to see the role Switchboard may play in leveling the playing field, uh, such that any publisher that wants to play in this space has the means to do it in a way uh, that is open, transparent, um, interoperable uh, and aligned with the mission of the organizations that are involved. For PLOS specifically, um, just given the, the nature of the stakeholders, the kinds of organizations involved, the mission of the organization, partnering on something like this seemed like a no brainer. Obviously uh, from a business perspective, it'll be very valuable to us, but from a mission um, alignment perspective, uh, it's critical to support these kinds of efforts as well. So we're excited uh, to be working with um, OA Switchboard and the communities and stakeholders that will be involved incredibly encouraging uh, for the way forward and uh, this is the way forward we are determined to deliver and our ambition is for the ecosystem to work better for everyone so that we can learn adjust and progress and uh, as this is a, a not-for-profit intermediary it works best if everybody participates that means in this intermediary there is more connections to be made between funders and publishers and institutions but it also means that our costs can be spread over more parties and uh, since we're not for profit that, sim profit, that simply means that the, the fees can get lower. So there's many reasons why uh, we are aiming for wide adoptions and, and continue to invite everybody to the table to, to join us in shaping this, building it, and, and also using it. Um, we have to be realistic. Uh, we regard 21 and 22 still as a launch phase because we need time. Uh, we've, we've seen it takes time uh, to um, achieve this adoption, uh, get people to sign up, and, and of course now, as of January, really starting to use it. But also we've seen it takes time for technical integration and implementation. If you want to benefit from the automation and the scalability, you want to build the APIs with your systems. And of course, that takes a bit of time. And we only build an MVP. Uh, we still have a, a wish list and a backlog, and we uh, want to further develop and improve the OA switchboard. Uh, given all of that, we are delighted that the following organizations have already confirmed our supports by signing up as early adopters, launching customers, and, and founding partners. I want to thank all of these funders, uh, launching sponsor, institutions, consortia, and, and publishers. And uh, as we speak, we are making connections and matches where there is use cases, where there are specific situations, where there's an opportunity or there is a, a problem, something that isn't going too well at the moment or is inefficient, and where the, the um, expectation and the, the hope is, the the intention is that the OA switchboard can make, make life better. So that is what we're, uh, we're doing. Uh, I wanna extend the invitation um, to everybody who's, uh, who's in, this, uh, in this meeting. Um, uh, I'm always happy to do one-on-one -on -one meetings. I've done so many last year and it's been so much fun, but also so encouraging. And it's also been so helpful in uh, being able to de deliver the, the MVP within time and budget. So I want to thank everybody who's contributed to that and who will hopefully moving forward also work with us in further building uh, uh, the OA switchboard. Um, if you want to stay informed, I invite you to also sign up to our mailing list for, for regular updates, but please do not hesitate to, uh, to reach out to me and uh, I hope to talk to you about the OA switchboard. Thank you.